I just watched the series finale of The Idol, and I have to say, my favorite part of this episode was when Jocelyn said, I'm the idol, baby, and then everybody clapped. I can't even say I was like truly disappointed in this finale, because I've been disappointed this whole time. It's like when my cat steps on my boobs every morning. Yeah, sure, I could get upset at him, but he's just gonna do it again tomorrow. Those are my freaking tits. And there's been a lot of bad finales to shows, mind you. Just to name a few off the top of the dome. There's How I Met Your Mother. There's Game of Thrones. There's fucking Lost. A show that infamously divided people because of its plot twist ending. But at least with all those shows, they made you care about the characters. Despite them fumbling the bag at the end, you could still derive entertainment from these shows. You still felt attached to the characters. Whereas as in the idol, not only did I not care about anybody, it left me feeling just disgusted. The episode opens with one of Jocelyn's new songs called Tough Love, which has lyrics such as force me and choke me until I pass out. Force me and choke me till I pass out. I, I mean, dude, the songs sound good. My kind of love. But the lyrics just really leave a weird flavor in your mouth. They kind of just make you want to go bleh, bleh, bleh. Tedros is being a baby. I mean, he's pretty much a baby now. And also Goo Goo Gaga. He's no longer a cult leader. In fact, he's just like a depressed shell of a man. Like Mr. Krabs when he fucking molted. Tedros tries to interject his opinion on the song, but Jocelyn tells him to leave. Plus you're gay. Just kidding about that last part, but damn, that would have been camp. You know, I think you should go. You want me to leave? Tedros is shocked that she's cutting off her source of inspiration. You wanna, you wanna cut off your lifeline? You wanna turn the faucet off? You wanna kill the soul in the room? As if getting with a brush is just some kind of well of artistry and inspiration. You know what? Let's pull that bucket up. Oops! All trauma! Tedros feels entitled to this song because it's about him, but Jocelyn quickly puts him in his place. The song's about me. Without me, no song. It's actually about me. I really don't have a problem with Jocelyn being independent and like standing her ground against this asshole. But what I do mind is the way that this show completely dismisses how abusive relationship dynamics actually work and how cult dynamics actually work. Like Sam Levinson prides himself on being so real. So raw. Oh, it's so real. But like is real in the room with us right now. Jocelyn recounts the story of how she met Tedros to Mike Dean. Did I ever tell you about how I first met this guy? Say, did I tell you this story? And she refers to Jenny as some random backup dancer. He uh, knew this like random backup dancer of mine. And he Which is one of many times that this episode just wants you to completely forget what's happened in other previous episodes. Because quite literally, that's just not what they conveyed. <laughs> While every instance of her and Jenny being together was brief, it did in fact seem like they were friends of sorts. Jocelyn says she likes the artists that Tedros brought into her life, but that she wants him to get the fuck out. You wanted to find a way into my life? You wanted me to hear your artists? I did. I like them. They can stay. You, on the other hand, can go. Later on, Lay wakes up Jocelyn because Finkelstein is on the phone, which I just learned is the name of the guy from the previous episode who made the joke about child shitting more blood than a kid at Epstein's Island. But anyways, he says he's coming by later because he has concerns about the tour. I'm gonna come by at one o'clock and we're gonna have a chat, okay? See you then. Lay also tries to tell Jocelyn something important, but Jocelyn completely blows her off. Joss, um, there's something important that I need to talk to you about. Does it have anything to do with the tour? No. Great. Nothing else matters to me right now. And again, I'm not trying to be mean, but Lay does do a weird little jaw thing and it's kind of funny. <laughs> so Jocelyn wakes up the cult downstairs and she tells them that Finkelstein, Nikki, Heim, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that dog that's on the side of Kane's chicken, like everybody is coming there later and they need to get their voices on and their titties and their booties out. All right, we have one shot. 
All right, one fucking shot. We're gonna put on the best fucking show they've ever seen. But Tedros keeps interrupting her like every time she's speaking until eventually she just says, Aye, aye, Captain. Shut the fuck up. Even the cult is ignoring him now. Oh, shut the fuck up. Yeah, shut the fuck up. Nobody's talking to you. In episode four, Chloe literally sang about how Tedros saved her life. And Tedros just saw me and he put his hand out. And he saved my life forever. And the other members were literally talking up a storm about how you can't say no to Tedros. No. <gasps> no. No. If Tedros heard you say that, you'd be in huge trouble. How has that dynamic completely just evaporated into thin air? So much for being realistic. <laughs> Jocelyn wants Ramsey, Chloe, and Isaac to be her opening act to her show. And Tedros is all like mad about this for some reason, which I'm not sure why, because was that not the goal this whole entire time to get her to pick up his artists? Oh, you, you want them to be your opening act. That's funny. That's very funny. She tells Tedros that these are her fucking people now. Tedros, these are my fucking people now. Oh, really? You just come and you just swoop down and you just fucking take it? And he's just like upset that his cult is getting abducted. This is it. The difference between me and him is I can actually make you a star. And I'll admit, this is an interesting concept. Like for somebody to come in and just slowly take over someone else's cult. But like, again, it really comes down to execution because none of this makes sense given the fact that two episodes ago she was just as brainwashed as everybody else. And I know people down in the comments are going to be like, but she masterminded the whole thing, blah, 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 blah. Okay, sure, that's what the show is saying now, but they did an extremely poor job of conveying that. I think the storylines in this are great. I just think the writing is like dog shit tier. Tedros tries to rev up Xander's friars. Rev up those friars. And he gets him to like stand up for himself so that that he can also sing on Jocelyn's tour. Come on, Xander. You're gonna let her fucking walk all over you like before. You have a fucking gift. Don't fucking forget that, huh? You're fucking talented. I want the world to see it. Which I don't really think this makes sense either because Xander himself experienced Jocelyn's mom forcing him to sign this contract. Did you not? Her mom didn't fucking like that I was a good singer or some shit, so she fucking- <laughs> Made you sign a fucking contract? Yeah. What the fuck does that gotta do with Jocelyn? We don't know. <laughs> Tedros tells the cult to get out their hoo-hahs and bazoongas. Bianca, I wanna see some ass and fucking tits. Don't forget. Sex sells. Which is also ironic because I feel like in the case of this show, sex definitely did not sell because much of the complaints are about the cringe sex scenes and over-sexualization of damn near everything. Jocelyn gets a call from Heartthrob Rob, but she ignores it because she's too busy brushing the fuck out of her fuck-ass bob. As soon as the producers show up, the cult immediately starts trying to like give them the pizzazz, you know, try to soup oh. them up. I I'm Nikki with two Ks. Okay, yeah. yeah. Chloe greets them by skipping towards them, of course, in a thong. It's not even just that they've established now that this character is underaged. It's that they still have her acting childlike while also making sure to include her ass in scenes. Like, it's just strange. <laughs> Tedros ends up drunkenly calling Nikki a TikTok-obsessed algorithmic cunt. In? Okay. You know, you're just, you're just a fucking TikTok obsessed fucking algorithm cunt. And everyone acts like this is like a banger insult. Like, dang, this is what we've been waiting for. Finally, somebody said it. Ooh, whoa, okay, oh, dude. That's a little cliche. A <laughs> okay, don't get me wrong. I think TikTok can be super toxic for artists, albeit sometimes very helpful. But for the most part, I think for a lot of people, boiling your art down to what is algorithmically satisfying is not really fun. Did the show convey that TikTok and algorithms are a big problem in the music industry? Or even that Nicki was pushing for shittier, more danceable songs to put on TikTok? No! Literally, none of the actual subject matter that this show claims to be about is in the show. Chloe performs a song for them called Like a God, which is actually very good. Like this actress is so amazing at singing. I mean, all of them are. You have to let him make you cry. I know you're scared. 
But it's like this slow, passionate ballad, and this chick over here is just like going off. Let him make you cry. I know. Meanwhile, Lay is on the phone with Rob, and he's like freaking out because, well, remember how in the last episode, Xander and unnamed cult member number five were taking pictures of him, and she was like crawling up on his lap, and he was uncomfortable, but they were like flashing pictures and like trying to frame him for something? <laughs> well, personally, I thought that they were going to frame him for cheating on Jocelyn so that she would never want to see him again. But instead, they accused him of rape. I'm telling you, I didn't anyone at Jocelyn's house. I didn't do this. I know, I know, I know you're not a and as he's trying to explain this to Lay, they forced me to see the back of this guy's fucking head for the 508th time. Sam, this tattoo is not that deep. He says that this girl has been going to the press and she's been saying that she has witnesses. This girl just jumped in my fucking lap and now she's going to the press saying I her and she has witnesses? As if this show could not get any worse, dude. There's already so many people that believe that women are formulating evil plots against men to ruin their whole lives. And this weird agenda is the reason why so many victims do not come forward. Lay tries to tell Xander what's going on, but of course he participated in the framing of Rob, so he's not really surprised, nor does he care. So he says this. Oh no. He's got that huge movie coming out. Please kill me and reincarnate me into a tiny little isopod. I can't take it. Xander claims that Jocelyn already knows about the whole Rob situation and that's why she's ignoring him. And Lay defends him and says that she doesn't think that he would do something like that. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think Rob would do something like that. To which Xander says, You don't think people are capable of hiding what they really are. It's literally impossible to ignore the misogynistic dog whistling that this show does. It's like a Trojan horse for misogyny, dude. It's just like, like oozing out. Like, no, it's not misogyny in here. Don't worry. Like, it, there's just enough leeway for them to try to say that it's not. But it is. Especially with that whole, he's got a big movie coming out line. Like, oh. There's such a big stigma with confronting people people who have a platform, no matter how significant of a celebrity they even are, and no matter how many receipts you have on the situation, a lot of people truly want to believe that women are just evil, maniacal beings out to get you. Nikki and Finkelstein end up loving every artist that performs for them, so much so that Nikki wants to work with Tedros now. <laughs> You did this. Yeah, this is... You know, I mean, it's amazing. And Tedros is like pissing and crying because he thinks that Jocelyn is trying to steal the credit away from him finding these artists. You may not believe it, but she's trying to take all the credit for it, but no. these are my, these are I, my babies. I feel like the show wants us to think that that's a really fucked up thing that Jocelyn's doing, but I don't really see a reason why she should really even give him credit. Why would she? Jocelyn is the one with like all the connections. What the fuck is he doing? Just abusing them. For some reason, Nikki is like extremely pro Tedros. I know it's you. This is incredible. She's like, I know you did this and not Jocelyn. This has you written all over it, Tedros. I know that Jocelyn didn't do this. You did it. This has you all over it. And I've known you for five minutes now, so I, I could just tell. I could just smell it. Because they want to believe that it's just Jocelyn. They do. What the fuck? I noticed that. Uh, they just they won't even acknowledge. <laughs> Nikki ends up getting a buzz on her phone about how Rob has been accused of sexual assault. Yeah, apparently he raped a woman. I mean, a very well endowed woman. And when Jocelyn asks what evidence they have on this, Nikki just says, what evidence do they have? Uh, well, I mean, you saw the girl, right? The real underlying message of that is giving people will believe any girl who is attractive when she makes claims like this. And what does conventional attractiveness have to do with it being a nothing literally nothing jocelyn says that he's never been weird with her and tedros is like well i've heard things i've heard stuff i've heard stories you have, you have. like what things like what kind of things like violent things but in the middle of all this, all this tension, all this drama in the air, Xander just gets up and is like, I think I should sing a song for the producers. Guys, hello. I was kind of thinking that um, maybe I should 
Say something. And it's just so bad that it's comical. Like we're in the middle of a conversation about Jocelyn's ex being accused of and he's just like, it's time to sing a song. Granted, Tedros did tell him to do it, but God, what a weird time to interject. Oh my God. But this is the first that Jocelyn's hearing that Xander wants to perform or that he's going to try to. So she looks at Tedros like, what the hell? Oh no, oh what, no. But just plays it off like she's cool with it. Tedros, did you plant this? We decided to put on a show. Xander performs My Sweet Lord by George Harrison. Oh my lord. And I have no comment on this cover whatsoever. I mean, he's Troy Sivan, his voice is nice, but it ends up being kind of cringe just because he says, Get on your fucking feet! My sweet lord. Get on your fucking feet! Jocelyn pulls Tedros out of the room and confronts him about Rob. She says she knows he did this and that he's like a little tiny stink bug on her shoe, basically. You think I don't know you did this? Because you're small and you're petty and you're jealous. And ultimately ends up kicking his ass out of the house. Get out of my house. Something that she should have done a long time ago, to be honest. But maybe she was worried that the cult wouldn't stay with her without him or something. Or maybe she just wanted to like torture him a bit. I don't know. Tedros, of course, refuses to leave. And when Jocelyn says that she'll call the cops, he says this. Then I'll keep you hostage. Then they'll fucking kill you. Not before I fucking kill you first, bitch. And this is the guy, again, that ultimately at the end of this episode, we are supposed to feel sympathetic to. Jocelyn tells Haim to pay Tedros as much money as it takes to get him out of her life forever. Pay him whatever the fuck he wants to get out of my life forever. Meanwhile, Finkelstein suggests that Xander sings with Jocelyn on her tour, and she acts like that was her idea the whole time. Like, that was, oh, of course, of course. I think you are always one step ahead. Xander's gonna open for me. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, of course he is. Anyways, though, then Jocelyn does like a five minute long interpretive dance for Finkelstein to show him her new song. And at one point she's like crawling around like a skinwalker. Like it's actually scary. I'm scared. I do not claim this energy. Meanwhile, Tedros is getting kicked out and Haim offers him $500,000 to leave her alone. But he rips that check up and says, She's worth so much more than money. Finkelstein loves her skinwalker dance and says that that's the best music she's ever made and more importantly for the plot. Suffice to say the tour is back on. And that's yeah. your, that's All of this while Lei is seen packing up her things and leaving a note for Jocelyn like she's permanently leaving. And to that, I have to say, if only we cared. I would have loved it if we actually understood their friendship and how deep it went. And I feel like this could have cut deep. But the reality is they were rarely ever in any scenes together in the show. Their interactions were usually no more than a few words. Yeah. How was I supposed to feel about her leaving? I'm going to sound like Jeff from Survivor right now, but I'm sorry, I got nothing for you. Then we cut to Jenny in a meeting with Nikki in her office office and Nikki's giving her some bad news. Nikki says that one of the writers of First Class Sinner is causing like a legal problem and that they'll have to delay the release of the song. And dude, I'm not trying to rip Jenny a new one. Please, K-pop fans, please do not attack me. But her acting in the scene, man, it's it's a little stinky. Little tiny turd in the diapy. We're going to have to hold the release of the song. But you said I have a full team of legal support. Nikki suggests that she writes a song of her own about this legal problem for as inspiration. I mean, why don't you try writing a song of your own in the meantime? You want me to write a song about a legal issue for my first single? Well, I'm just throwing ideas out there. And Jenny's like freaking pissed, duh. But Nikki tries to reassure her that she's a star. We're gonna make you a star. I mean, Diane, we got you. You're a star and we're gonna make you a star. And then, oh my God, then she walks walks Jenny out to the elevator, and as the doors are closing, she says this. It was Jocelyn, wasn't it? 
that storyline has to be like one of the top 10 watch mojo failures of all time because like who cares then we get a long compilation of jocelyn being at home alone the cult is nowhere in sight so i don't really know what happened i guess maybe they decided to all move into their own apartments and just be normal i don't know but either way jocelyn tries to sing alone but she can't she's like oof, oof. Oof, oof. Talia meets Haim in a parking garage and I don't know why but she parked super far away from him so she has to walk like hella far in high heels. Maybe it was just to get this cinematic shot but I just thought it was kind of silly. But anyways, he asks her if she can do him a favor and write a bigger, better story that will help Jocelyn. My girl's in a lot of trouble and uh, I could use your help. And this piques her interest. I'm listening. Cut to six weeks later, Jocelyn is on the back of a golf cart on her way to her dressing room to prepare to perform. And she's wearing what I would call the Basic Instinct dress, which if you didn't know, Basic Instinct is a film from 1992, which is about a femme fatale. It's really crazy. There's even like a coochie shot in it. Super infamous. She seduces people. She manipulates people. She is evil. In fact, in episode one, Jocelyn and Lay were watching that movie at one point. And I'll give credit where credit's due. This could have been a really good callback and a like, whoa, it was there the whole time moment. But honestly, all of these plot twists, including the one that's gonna happen in a second, are sort of like if I told you that this whole time, this whole time I've been making videos, my soul has been trapped in that thing. Yeah, bet you're feeling a little stupid right now. Pay attention next time time okay jocelyn's walking with security to get backstage and somehow in this empty stadium there's like a random fan that shouts at her like where is this fan why why are they here it's empty there's no there's nobody there yet the cult starts performing that goddamn family song again and oh my god it's just it's not even like a bad song it's just like it just goes on for too long that's my Finkelstein is watching them and he says that this is a gold mine of mental illness, which I actually thought was really funny. You know, I'm telling you, there's a gold mine of mental illness. But then he quickly ruined it by saying, all you have to do is admit it and then people feel sorry for all you. I know. Heim, Nikki, and Finkelstein are all talking shit about Tedros. And I mean, rightfully so. The fucking guy was like herpes. We couldn't even <laughs> fucking get rid of him. And they mentioned that Talia put out an article about him, which was like a deep dive of like his past and like, fully exposed him for pimping out girls and all these other crazy things that he did. The quotes That's right. from the hookers he used to She's pimp the out, yeah. the one girl he used to fucking, I didn't think he had it in him. And apparently that was the only way they got rid of him. That's right. Fucking Vanity Fair Talia article. Is yeah. hot. Took his ass I out. I love her. Dude. Meanwhile, Tedros is actually arriving at the stadium and he's asking if there's a VIP pass left for him under the name Tedros. But come to find, his VIP pass is actually under the name Mauricio. I have something for Mauricio, so you have a great night, Mr. Jackson. Then Nikki says, You guys, we ruined him. <laughs> <laughs> and they linger on this shot for like a hot couple seconds. Ruined. <laughs> <We did> fucking... <laughs> fucking ruined him. <laughs> and while I was watching this, all I said was, Do I care? Do I feel bad? Am, am I supposed to feel bad? Even if these people are bad people, ultimately what they did was a good thing. Like, Tetro should not be a producer. He should not be allowed to be around musicians. Tedros meets with Destiny and they have what I would call a very, um, crusty conversation. You are and were a pimp. It is what it is. We all gotta do what we gotta do to survive. Destiny tells him that she doesn't care about his past and all that matters is what he does now. But the question is, what are you going to do now? 
And like, listen, dude, I'm all for people changing and growing as a person. In fact, please change and grow as a person. However, this guy pimped women, abused them, brainwashed an entire cult, including grooming a 17 year old minor. And however way you want to look at it from his point of view was enjoying abusing Jocelyn as well. And what accountability has he taken? Where is his growth at? I'm supposed to agree with this? Ultimately though, she threatens him at the end. If you muff up and you hurt her, I will hunt you down like the motherfucking dog you are. And leaves us with one last zinger. Enjoy the motherfucking show. God, I am actually going to miss her a little bit. He meets Jocelyn in her dressing room and they both say that they miss each other. I missed you. I missed you too. None of this means as much without you. Then he picks up the infamous hairbrush and he's like touching the bristles and he's like, didn't you say this was the brush that your mom beat you with? Did you say this was the brush your mom beat you with? I did. And then he says, It's brand new. Whoa! Holy shit, that's crazy. She was faking that too? Even though Xander previously said that he witnessed the abuse? Whoa! Bitches do be lying. What do I say? What can I say? Then Tetris and her get on a golf cart and he does look kind of hella dead inside. Jocelyn goes on stage and says a Tedros classic, actually. Hello, angels. And to everyone's surprise, including Haim, and especially Tedros, she pulls him on stage and calls him the love of her life in front of everyone. Tonight is incredibly special because I have the opportunity to introduce you to the love of my life. And then privately, she says this. You're mine. Forever. Now go stand. And then it just ends with everybody chanting her name and her just standing there. But yeah, uh, I can't think of a worse thing to do for your career than state that the love of your life is this guy that just got publicly outed to everybody as somebody who has pimped women and done all these horrible things. Like if this happened in real life, it would definitely be met with quite a few boos. Like dude, Taylor Swift dated somebody who was problematic, but significantly less so than this guy. And people wouldn't even stand that. Like, is this not gonna leave a crazy bad taste in a lot of her fans mouths but you know okay girl boss slay slay girl boss wow so so that was the end of that show and as much as i hated it i did enjoy making these videos very much and i enjoyed talking about it with you all so please let me know what other series or movies you would like me to watch and review thank you guys so much for watching and special thanks to my patrons you are fucking amazing and i'll see you guys very soon. Bye-bye. They don't know my soul is in here. I know. They have no idea. Isn't that funny? <laughs> it's hilarious. I love you. I love you.